yeah, part two, this is about demons. Um, this, uh, this has got, uh, this is an analogy. I don't know if you know that, um, but this is either called demonology or satanology. Now, I don't know if you remember um, the BT advert. Depends when you were born, uh, 1988, apparently. I remember this advert. Maureen Lippmann, uh, there was a BT advert. And the common, there was a, a, a phrase that was said uh, called, he's got an ology. Uh, this is one ology you do not want. Uh, there's many ologies we want. We want to be qualified in many things that we study for. This is one we do not want to be qualified in. Uh, we just want to know about it and then uh, ask Jesus, ask God for his help and support as we learn who he is. We know from last week that demons are angels that have sinned against God and now work for evil in the world. So this week our purpose in learning about demons and Satan is so that we remain uh, rooted in the faith by knowing the truth from God's word. What this will do will equip us uh, to know who demons are, so not succumb to temptation uh, that they might place in front of us. I'm not in the habit of normally quoting non-Christians, uh, but I think in this case it's probably a good observation. Uh, Sun, Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of War, he says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Um, I think I would change some of that from a biblical perspective. There's a lot about me, you, in that statement, um, but obviously he was not a Christian. Um, and I would say if you know Jesus, if you know that you need him and that you know your enemy, uh, you need not fear. You need not fear anymore. Uh, I think we're in a battle today, every day, for our very soul. Um, but the art of war in the Bible is, is, is a very different reality than that of the art of war, according to Sun Tzu. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse 12, says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, uh, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. We'll look into the aspect of demonic activity next week, um, but we should first know ourselves to, and know our, who our enemy is. We should get to know who, uh, certainly who we are um, and who God says we are. And then we should also know who this enemy is uh, that wants us to not be believers, to not be Christians, to not believe in God. Uh, the demons and even Satan himself were at one stage good, um, when God made the universe and everything in it, everything was good. He didn't make Satan. Uh, he made angels who were good, and angels fell. Angels decided uh, to rebel against God after creation uh, and the temptation of Adam and Eve. And then they fell. Jude 6 says this, uh, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their proper dwelling, these uh, he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Uh, there's one of the best eyewitness accounts of Satan's own fall from the heavens, uh, from, from heaven itself. Uh, and Jesus says this in Luke 10, verse 18. He says, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Uh, best eyewitness account, most reliable eyewitness account, I would argue, is Jesus Christ. Uh, no need to doubt what he says. Um, but to understand demons, we should really learn who Satan is. If fallen angels follow Satan, then whatever Satan does, he will likely use demons to carry out the grunt work. He will use demons to carry out work that is probably a bit uh, of a lower level work. Many years ago, I think I've shared this before, and some of you will, will know this, but um, there was a, a pastor who preached here uh, from another church, uh, and he was, he was the pastor at Belvedere Baptist Church. And one of the things he was concerned with, uh, concerned about, was that if the church was not sharing the gospel, uh, not even the demons would bother with us. Not even Satan or the demons would care whether we were sharing the gospel, uh, certainly if we weren't sharing the gospel. Um, in fact, if we, if we lacked a determination to share the gospel, among others, we could in fact be doing Satan's job for him. 
if we're not sharing it among our daily lives and, and seeing opportunity in a way where we're sort of doing the work inadvertently. Let me say this, it's not on purpose that we're doing that work, but we're adding to effectively what Satan wants us to do. He wants to be comfortable. He wants us to be just okay about things. He wants us to be okay about the world around us. And so when we don't share, we are contributing to somewhat of, of his work. And, and I would hope most of the time that is inadvertent. And so that's why he wouldn't challenge. That's why he wouldn't bother with us, with anyone who is not in some way sharing the gospel and sharing the reason for their hope, the reason uh, that they believe. Satan and his demons will try every tactic to blind people to the truth. He will even uh, try to encourage a sense of apathy. He creates a false sense of security. So we think we're okay when in fact we are far from it. The example I can give about this is what we see today. Uh, and I don't know if you ever noticed it. You may, just, you may just let it pass you by, but whenever there's something happens and we have something on the news and something bad happens, and the news is really good at reporting bad stuff, isn't it, all the time? Um, but one thing, one thing they do almost constantly is when there's a terrible thing that's occurred and someone has perpetrated that act, do you know the one thing they say? It's the minority. It's, it's always in the minority. And, and I kind of let this go, but I keep thinking about this, and I, here's what I wonder. I wonder whether that mindset of always these bad things and evil things being in the minority actually are trying to distract us and trying to give us a false sense of security about the world. Actually, we know in our hearts and we know from the Bible that every single person is fallen, every single person is broken, every single person can do an act of evil. So when they start saying it's only a small minority of people, actually, I, I do start to wonder, is this a tactic? that's used to tell us it's okay. Everyone else is pretty much good. And you guys, these guys over here who are, who are just doing these bad, there are only a few of them. There's only a few of them doing it. I, I don't know that that's true. I think many things go unreported. Many things that we've not seen, certainly Christian acts against Christians who are sharing the gospel go mostly unreported in mainstream news. And so we know many more terrible things happen around the world than what we hear on the news. And so I think what that does is, is, is maybe it, uh, Satan uses that as a way to give us a false sense of security. 1 Chronicles 21, 1 to 7, uh, this is uh, when David um, had had many battles, many victories. And he says this, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the troops, go and count these Israelites from Beersheba to Dan, then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. But Job replied, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. My Lord the King, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? The King's word, however, overruled Joab. And so Joab left and went throughout Israel and came back to Jerusalem. Joab reported the number of the fighting men to David. In all Israel, there were one million one hundred 100,000 men who could handle a sword, including 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include Levi and Benjamin in numbering because the king's command was repulsive to him. This command was also evil in the sight of God, so he punished Israel. David, in this account, was tempted by Satan. And what he wanted to do was to take pride in the number of people he had fighting behind him. And so this is actually a point in the, in the account where he has had many victories over the enemies. There's, a, there's roughly about five different groups of uh, people that have actually won. And he gets to this point, and then suddenly, as David is obviously worshipping God and thanking God for all the victories, Satan says, yeah, but look how many you've got. Look at all the people behind you. Look how great you are. If all these people are here, must mean something that you, you're quite important. You're quite, you're quite great, aren't you? And so he tempts David to look at the number of people. He, he takes comfort and allows his false sense of security to come between him and God by trusting and taking pride in what he could see around him. And so he, he, he's told when he comes back and reports back to him, he says, you've got all these people. And even obviously Joab is like, you shouldn't be doing this. 
you should not be counting these people. This is the Lord's work. This is what the Lord is doing. Instead of trusting in the one who provided the protection for Israel in the first place, he's saying he started to be tempted of what uh, Satan wants him to believe. Interestingly, though, when David uh, um, wrote in the Psalms, he made this statement also. And uh, we don't, it's hard to know the timing of this statement, but Psalms 20, Psalm 20, verse 7 to 8, some trust in chariots, some in whole horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They're brought to their knees and fall, but we, we rise up and stand firm. So you can see how instantly there is this moment. David does believe this, and David is absolutely convinced that the Lord is doing all the work. And he's using David in order to carry out that work. But then, of course, there's the whisper in the ear. There's the temptation of greatness, of his own greatness that he could celebrate. But just in this one account alone, we can learn a whole lot about demons and Satan and, and ourselves also. And what's led up to this moment has been a series of victories over his enemies. And I can only imagine when I read this, uh, the, the lull, the, when there was a peace time, as it were, not peace, but certainly when there was a quiet time, after all the victories he had, I think he became, he wasn't watchful anymore. I think he got too relaxed. And Peter warns us about this as well. At 1 Peter 5 verse 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. David, I think maybe, like many of us, take our eye off the ball for a short time uh, and that's the moment that's the only moment sometimes the enemy needs to to whisper to say something to tempt us into doing something we should be clear that satan and demons never rest in fact most of the time we'll find that satan is waiting for this opportunity uh, when we just maybe not um, not keeping our eye on the ball 2 corinthians 11 verse 3 says I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived, deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. It's interesting because we know, and I have to always state this because this is uh, sometimes misunderstood, uh, that when uh, Eve took the fruit, as it were, uh, Adam was standing right next to her. Uh, what we know from the account of what happened is that Adam did not tell his wife of what God said to him about how to stay away from the tree of life and what it meant. And we get that, when you read through Genesis in the account, you get that uh, very sense that Adam was not leading uh, his wife in that sense. He was not telling her, he was not giving her cover in terms of uh, when she was alone, but actually it turns out he was right there watching her as well. But she took, as it were, she was naive to some degree but actually she still shouldn't have taken it she still shouldn't have taken it and adam should have done what he should have been doing equally responsible in god's kingdom both punished because they're equally responsible for the sin that's been committed uh, against god but i think sometimes uh, we treat the enemy uh, that we find in satan as, as some occasional disruptor in human effort I think we sometimes think, oh, he's, he's, in, in one moment, suddenly he's just doing this for now, and then we can go, kind of go back to our normal lives. But Satan's a bit more clever than that, and, 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 he's, and he works hard to try and disrupt us. And it, it's not even so in the obvious things either. It's not that you're having a season or a time of the, the devil speaking at you and, and trying to tempt you. He, there's always things he will use in, your, in our weakness to try and tempt us away from God. Satan and his demons have a plan to lead as many away from God as possible. But moreover, he works to lure people away from the notion of even becoming a Christian. Uh, it, is, it is in part, in part, why many do not uh, embrace Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to remember that Satan's intention from the very, very beginning was to be God himself and to be worshipped as God. He wanted God's throne. And today he operates under the determination to have Christians and non-Christians worship him and not worship a holy God. So to underestimate Satan is foolishness. 
Satan is an actual being with a mind and emotions. He's actually a created being. He has a will to do evil in the world. When Jesus was in the wilderness, uh, he tempted Jesus to misuse his authority and power. Uh, Satan is not only a force of evil, but that evil itself is in the person of Satan. And many people will misunderstand and think that, well, Satan is just a force of evil. And, and there lies the trap. The moment we think that there's just a force of evil around us, we could end up using that as an excuse to say, it's not my fault that I made this decision. It's not my fault because there's this, this force operating around us that we can't understand. But as Christians uh, uh, who read the Bible... Uh, who, and who see who Satan is, the force only exists because Satan powers that force. He makes it happen. He is the one carrying out the work to try and disrupt Christian lives and to take them away from Jesus, take them away from God, even stop them altogether coming to him. The great thing is, Jesus was able, and still able, to command Satan to leave him. Because Satan is not equal to God in one way, any way whatsoever. Satan is not a Satan versus God. There is, an, there is a, thankfully, an unfair fight. God will always win this fight and has won this battle. Satan is not equal to God in power, for he is a created being who fell from the glories and graces of God, who actually was most treasured by God himself. We see that in scripture last week. And then he falls. He's a creative being who chose to rebel against God, but does not have the same power as God in any way whatsoever. So Satan being a creative being will always be the loser in the war against Jesus and his followers. And the fact he's created means he's limited in power. So without underestimating Satan, let's not overestimate, overestimate his power, authority, and ability. We often see um, representations of hell in movies and TV shows where Satan is ruling and living in hell itself. Uh, I don't know any uh, show that I've ever watched, any film, where they depict Satan, and he's not seemingly living in hell. In fact, this is entirely wrong. Uh, Satan does not rule hell whatsoever. Uh, and we, we've gone along with this idea that that's what happens. Uh, Satan sits in hell and he rules from down there. And God sits in heaven and he rules from up here. And there's this constant fight. It's why we get a misunderstanding that there might be a quality between God and, and the devil. Absolutely not. The devil is not living and ruling, as it were, in hell. We can see this in scripture. And it will tell us that hell was actually created as a punishment for Satan and his demons. Uh, 2 Peter 2 verse 4, for if God did not spare his angels when they sinned, we saw this last week, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. Now that to me does not say that Satan is ruling in that place. God has created a place, some translations say bottomless pit, that he threw Satan into after he sinned. What's interesting about uh, this one, though, is that uh, on 2 Peter 2 verse 4, this is potentially the time just after the fall of Adam and Eve. And so when the temptation happened, uh, this is supposedly, from what we know from the wording, is that there's a temporary state in hell where uh, God through sent those angels, those, those turned angels, those evil angels, and Satan himself, to a place to be held in judgment before judgment comes. But in the time of Revelation, it changes from being held for judgment to being cast into eternal fire and judgment being passed on Satan and angels. We see this in Matthew 25, verse 41. Uh, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you, are, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Here's what we know. Uh, we know that he'll be allowed to come out of this place and he'll be allowed in Revelation, according to Revelation, to go about and convince people, lie to people, 
that he is God and actually, obviously, he is not, and he will get people to believe in him. But then, as this verse describes, this is after that moment. What will happen is God will win the battle and he will send Satan and the angels into eternal fire where they'll never come back ever again. And that's great news. Now you might think, what, what does that mean in terms of what happens today? If, if he's in chains, how can he be roaming the earth? How can he be uh, influencing us or trying to tempt us? Here's what I think, uh, and this is only what I think. I'll, I'll definitely uh, caveat that and say this is what I think through reading the text. I think there is a length of chain that's been given to Satan to allow him to, to, to do what he can do within the limitations of what God has given him. He's allowed him to tempt, done that with Job, one of his best. He allowed him to, uh, to go after Job, as it were. And so I think when we think about whether he's just being held there, we know that actually he can actually even go up to heaven at this point and even have uh, audience with God. We know that because that's in Job 2, uh, where it says that he can uh, go and see God himself. We see that in here, I think it's, it's Job 1 verse 12. The Lord said to Satan, very well, then everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So we know he can be there. If he can be there for now, as in he can visit, we know he can visit this place. We know he can visit with his demons, with the angels that have fallen, and so do the work uh, that he wants to do to a degree. Here's some good news. Satan cannot be everywhere at once. Satan being a creative being is not like God in that sense. So he can't go around, as it were. He can't just be present with one person at the same time being present with another person. So the reason why he has to have legions of angels, of fallen angels, is because he needs them to do the work because he is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all at once. He has these demons under his command whose purpose it is to deceive and tempt people. And this work attempts to, uh, as it were, blunt the effect of God's word. Uh, in people's hearts. It blinds their minds. In other words, he tempts people to refuse to want to understand the gospel. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Satan does this by using deceitful tactics such as temptation, doubt, lies, guilt, fear, Confusion, sickness, envy, pride, slander. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And I think this is also a good point to not get too lost uh, in the reasoning that everything is Satan's fault. I think we, we tend to, as a society, whether you're Christian or whether it's about God or not, we tend to not want to take responsibility for our actions. Uh, we tend to want to find something else to blame for something that has gone wrong. But this verse speaks of a purposeful submission by people to the very tactics of the enemy. So when it says blinded, it doesn't mean that it's involuntary, just to be clear. This is where it gets a little bit, you know, we need to dig into the weeds. When, when we're blinded, it's not because we have no control over that blinding. It is because we chose to believe the lies of the devil, of Satan himself, and choose to not believe that God exists. Romans chapter 1 uh, tells you so. Maybe chapter 9. I'll get my Romans confused. Read Romans, and it will tell you why. But it speaks of a submission. So what we're doing is we're allowing, we're allowing Satan to deceive us. We accept his lies and we purposefully reject him, uh, reject God. So it's important to note that much of the emphasis on our sin against God is actually about the choices we make, not because of Satan. Uh, Galatians five sixteen to eighteen. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. You see, we're learning about who Satan and demons are. What we do not want to do is to make Satan more than he is. More importantly, we do not want to excuse our sin by simply blaming Satan or any of his uh, fallen angels for our choices. Uh, if we go back to Adam and Eve, did Satan, the snake, did he make Eve take the fruit? No. Did he put it in her hand? Did he force her hand open? Did he put it in her mouth? No. You know what he did? He lied about God's word. He rephrased God's word, even just to make it sound like God didn't even say it. And at that point, that was the only power that Satan had, was to try to confuse. It was not to make the choice for Adam and Eve. It was not to make them do it. They made the choice based on what was presented to them. The reason why no one can blame Satan for the actions they take is because Satan is not capable of making anyone do anything against their will. You see this, Genesis 3, 13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. It is through our own choice that we succumb to temptation. The only exception... And we will talk about this next week because it needs uh, some dedicated time. Is demonic possession. Uh, and that needs some unpacking because we need to be careful about what we talk about and what we say and what it means. But suffice to say, Satan's goal is to gain worship and followers. His goal is to gain people to follow and believe his lies. But we cannot blame him for the choice we make based on those lies. And the things we do and carry out based on the information that we've got from him. James 1 verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. In effect, it is the untamed desires of our heart that drag us away. And what Satan does, what the enemy does, is he speaks into those temptations. He speaks into those things in our heart and he says, go on, why not? It's okay. Got to be all right with it. Galatians 5, verse 19 to 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Let me put the full thing in there. I did put the full thing in there. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. At the core of it all is the acts of the flesh, not the works of the devil. In fact, there, apart from Revelation, there's actually not much mention of the devil himself. There's actually hardly a mention at all of him. Most of the time, it is the mention of our acts, our choices, in what we do in disobeying and dishonoring God. Knowing the full capabilities of Satan and demons help us to not only uh, know how to identify him, but tells us uh, much about who we are. We have the free choice to do unimaginable evil. We have the free choice to do unimaginable evil. And you only have to look around, in, even into history and even the world today, to know that that is true. That is pure fact. And yet, even on the scale of some of the things that have happened, we might be told, it's okay. It's the small minority. And yet there's been horrendous acts of evil committed against other human beings. So we know that within us, there is a desire to want to do evil. In fact, we did the worst possible evil when we put Jesus on the cross and we pillied him and we, we pelted him and we hated him for what he did. Because we all take responsibility. This is not just about Israel 
not just about Jewish people, this is all of us, a representation of what we would do unless Jesus, by his grace, took upon himself the choice to put himself on the cross, allow to be put on the cross, and to die for our sins. We have the free choice to do unimaginable evil, and history has proven to be the case. It's not the devil's doing, but instead presenting evil and sin as temptations, that if we were to act on them, would satisfy us. It seems evident, I think, that acts of evil feed more acts of evil. Uh, even in more recent times, we can think of uh, the war in Ukraine, and we could think of even, even taking a neutral perspective. It's humans killing human beings. It is evil, beyond evil. To kill one another is to kill God's creation itself, one of the highest of creation, human beings. Not to value life, but to wipe it out. That for me is evidence that the actual evil being committed is being committed by us as human beings. As Christians, as those that choose Christ and not believe the lies of Satan, we have the Holy Spirit living, up, living in us to help us overcome these temptations. 1 John 4, 2-4. to four. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We need to recognize that Satan's works through the efforts of demons to tempt people away from God, but we need to be awake to a very real fact. If the Holy Spirit does not reside in us, then the problem will continue to reside in us until we admit and submit to God. I'm going to give you a newsflash. We are the problem. But there's a way out. Paul mentioned this same fact, though, and he says this uh, about himself, Romans 7, 20 to 25, Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. What's interesting to know is that you might read the first verse of that and say, oh, it's sin living in me. I have nothing to do with that, and it just acts out, and I have no control over it. Paul clarifies and says, that's not the case. It's in me, for in my inner being I delight, yes, in God's law, but also he chooses to do evil. He chooses to do things which he shouldn't be doing. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Not what terrible person Satan is, what a wretched man he is. Who will rescue me? from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. So we should not place equality between God and Satan. Satan and his demons are limited in their own power, and by God's control. They're kept in eternal chains in gloomy darkness, says some translations. But Satan can be resisted. And I need to tell you something that some people do not agree with. Because I've seen it happen in, in, in churches, I've seen it happen in services uh, around the world probably. You and me cannot resist Satan. We are not possible. It is not possible for us to resist Satan. But some people will tell you, in, in a kind of, let me say, a, an indirect way, that our, we have the same power as Jesus to overcome Satan. Not that we have Jesus, but that we have the same power as Jesus. 
because what's been taught there is that I'm a little God and I have the same power as Jesus Christ. And here's how the thinking goes. Because Jesus was a man and God made him God, therefore I'm a man and therefore I can have the same power as Jesus. No, it doesn't work that way. I am only saved because Jesus Christ, not because of anything I am, not because of anything I do, not because of how great and good works I do or might do. It's because of Jesus. James 4 verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. What it doesn't say is that he'll flee from you because he's scared of you. The devil is terrified of a victorious Jesus. That's what he is terrified of. Because he knows what's coming. He knows what's at the end. And he knows he loses. But here's what he wants to do. He wants to cause utter destruction and chaos before Jesus returns. And he wants everyone to believe that there is no God, that God doesn't exist, and Jesus did not need to do what he did, and even Jesus did not exist. Even if the evidence is presented to tell you that he does and did exist. And so he wants to lie and he wants to cause confusion and he wants to spread slander about who God is. So submit yourselves then to God, because when we submit ourselves to God, we can resist the devil and he'll flee from us because it's Jesus he's scared of, not me or you. Trust in Jesus, trust in God. If David had just not gone that way, trusted in God right at the end, the devil would have fleed from him. He said, no, I'm not taking, I'm, I could probably try and take David on, I'm not taking Jesus on. We know when Jesus called out the, uh, and I'll go into this because it's about demonic uh, uh, possession, when he called them out of the pigs, they ran away. Uh, sorry, they ran out of the humans into the pigs. The pigs went a little bit crazy, right? And the pigs started running everywhere and they started going mad. And they run into the, uh, I think it was into the, uh, the swamp uh, off the cliff. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. And, and they, they basically killed themselves. They killed the thing they were in, they possessed. Because Jesus commanded them out. That's how powerful Jesus is. Not because of the person, not because they wanted the, the devil out of them, the, uh, the possession out of them. Jesus called them out. I said, you want to take on me? <laughs> no way, Jesus. We're off. And we'll get into that next week. But here is some encouragement and this very heavy subject. Satan cannot know our future. He has enough knowledge only on the basis that he watches us every day. So he can only know who we are by the actions that we take. And then what he does, like any other person in some ways, he gets to know us and he says, I'm going to try and put this temptation in their way. I'm going to put this temptation in their way. But he doesn't know the decisions we'll make. He doesn't even know what we're thinking. In case someone tells you that's what he can do, he can't. He can't know what we're even thinking. He literally has to observe in order to know how to tempt us. That's actually quite powerful because it means he's not actually able to get into your head. All he's going to do is read you. He's going to try and read you and say, I think there's a weakness here and a weakness here and I'm going to try and put some temptation there. He can't know for certain that we're what we are thinking or what we will do. When I think of when, uh, in the Bible, when it says that Satan lives in this place, or uh, sorry, is in this place, is bound in this place, in the bottomless pit, and then he does, he, he can't read our minds, he can't know our thoughts like God can, I think this Satan must be so frustrated when people turn to Jesus. I mean, he must hate. He has no power like God, no power like Jesus. And so the only thing he can do is to try to say, is Jesus real? Do you really believe in God? Do you know him? Say, like, yeah, I know him. I read the Bible. It tells me all about him. And because I believe in him, I confess all my life. I knew in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I think you need to leave Satan. 
So now we know who Satan really is. We do not need to focus on trying to fight Satan, which is not our job anyway. He said it comes down to, in knowing all of this, one simple thing. We need to submit to the one who's already conquered death. We need to submit to the one who has had victory and has victory over Satan himself, Jesus Christ. And as I've gone through that, here's what I say. And this is, sounds contradictory. We've gone through all that and yet I'm here I'm going to say to you, just trust in Jesus. Don't get wrapped up in Satan. Don't get wrapped up in his demons and demonology and Satanology. It's good to know who he is. It's good to know who our enemy is. But we know who our saviour is. And the way to overcome Satan is to believe in Jesus. There was like a 101 Sunday school ending there, wasn't it? Yeah? Welcome to Sunday school. Okay, let's pray. Uh, and then we'll worship together. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, that you sent your son who uh, who we, we didn't deserve to have as our saviour. We do not deserve him. Uh, and yet, Lord, we now have our holy God who is amazing, who is gracious, forgiving, precious. Thank you, Lord, that um, you didn't need us but you want us. Thank you that you sent your son so that we may live in Jesus Christ who now lives and rules from the heavenly throne. Thank you, Lord, that he rose again so that we may have a new life in him. Thank you that he has all power to defeat Satan and his demons. Thank you that you are all powerful, that all the glory belongs to you. And so, Lord, we just want to give you praise and thanks uh, that, Lord, even though we are tempted every day, Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who can give us encouragement and confidence that Jesus has overcome that temptation for us. Pray, Lord, that we'll push into you when those temptations, temptations come, that we remember the death on the cross the price that has been paid so that we sh we're shaken out of our temptation to sin. Lord, may it then be a celebration of what you've done for us, Lord, that we, we didn't deserve. May we then glorify you in worship. Lord, thank you as you guide us and protect us through learning about our, the enemy. So, Lord, we, we continue to pray. Be with us, Lord as we worship and glorify you, the one who has overcome, the one who has, has victory. We ask all these things in his precious name. Amen.